and welcome to a special edition of the Niner Fiver Roundup. Um, when we stopped doing the the weekly roundups uh, a little while ago, we said we'd do them every now and again as 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 need arose, and this week need has arisen. Um, so we're going to uh, delay by a week the part second part of our two part um, investigation into homelessness in Ontario. And instead, we're going to talk today about uh, the Auditor, Gen Auditor General's report into um, the provincial government's uh, action towards the uh, Green Belt and, um, and uh, the damning conclusions that she reached. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And well, Joel, do you want to kick off with kind of summary of, of, of where we are? Um, basically, everything we've thought was going on with this government, uh, the Auditor, Auditor General Bonnie Lissick said was right. It was true. The, the, uh, I'm going to summarize here a 95-page report uh, as best I can. But basically, um, yeah, so the Greenbelt parcels of land that were freed up in, uh, by, the, by the Ford government a little while ago were, were basically, A, they're not needed to meet the housing targets of one and a half million homes uh, to be built that we need for the homeless uh, housing crisis here in, uh, on, in Ontario. Uh, she said explicitly, it's not needed. That Greenbelt opening was not needed. And how the opening, the opening was carried out is basically the heart of this, uh, well, the scandal in that essentially developers went with envelopes with detailed parcels of land that they were planning to buy to uh, uh, the chief of staff of the minister of uh, municipal affairs and, and housing, uh, Steve Clark, and said, basically, we want this plot, these plots of land to be freed up, freed up from uh, rebuild regulations and, and scrutiny, because uh, we're going to buy it. And literally within, a, I almost want to say the next day or a few months later, those are the parts of land that were freed up in this green belt swap. Uh, the minister and premier Ford have all said that they had no, no idea that this was happening. This was entirely uh, the chief of staff of the, the minister uh, of municipal affairs and housing. This was completely his doing. He was directing staff uh, underneath him and the minister and the premier were completely caught unaware by it. That's their, their story. And that's when they're sticking to it. Uh, now you think somebody's going to get, have to fall on their sword for this and somebody's going to have to take the blame somebody's going to have to, to put in their resignation and we're going to have to stop doing stop where we're going with the green belt and we're going to have to reevaluate that plan and 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 maybe go a different route no none of that is happening nobody's getting fired nobody's losing their job nobody is resigning their their, their ministership those parts of land are going to remain as they are no the green belt is not going to be returned to as it was uh, this government is pressing on as if nothing happened, as if they did nothing wrong. The, I don't think the people of Ontario are going to buy this uh, one way or another. Well, I don't think the people of Ontario who never liked Doug Ford are going to buy it, um, which was, was and always has been and always will be the majority of Ontarians as it happens. Um, just that that same majority of Ontarians can't get their act together to vote for uh, one party at an election time. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's exactly what we thought it was. Um, and this, you used the word, word scandal. This is a scandal. Um, and I'm using the word, making a point of highlighting that because I try to avoid using words like scandal uh, because it's too easy to say this is a scandal and this is a scandal mm -hmm. and stop putting gates on the end of everything um and it's actually part of the problem we're seeing with the with the opposition being completely unable to make a major scandal stick and i think you know the press have had their day saying this is a disgraceful the government will take a hit over this but the government will also say basically brush it under the carpet uh, the premier had his press conference and kind of dissembled and, and, and distracted and took a pot shot at the mayor of Burlington, which we'll get onto. Um, just basically everything other than it, except any kind of level of responsibility or, or guilt whatsoever. But what is the government mm -hmm. 
doing deals for its friends that will make them billions of dollars. That's billions of dollars of corruption right there. That's eight, billions eight, of dollars. Eight billion. The, we know what the number is uh, potentially eight billion. And uh, also, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do want to underscore this. The Auditor General herself said that she could, was very conservative, no pun intended, on that estimate. She thinks it could be very much a higher value because uh, she was using a, a a model that was a few years ago. So we could be, we said eight, 8 billion at least, probably a couple billion more. And everybody knew, the Doug Ford knew, the, the minister uh, Clark knew that this was going to be very controversial. It was a big chunk of Greenbelt, uh, uh, quite different from the tiny, small amounts of Greenbelt that the previous government had tinkered around with from time to time. Uh, they tried to equate the two, but below me, it's not true. I'm talking about thousands and thousands of acres here. Um, there was no need for it unless you wanted your friends to get rich. That's the only reason to do this. There is no need, there's no need in terms of planning, there's no need in terms of development, despite the housing shortage, despite all those things that we talked about in our last episode about the need for housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adding this land to the pool of land that's available to do developers does nothing to accelerate development of housing and above all affordable housing in this province. Uh, all it does is harm the environment. All it does is make a load of fat uh, uh, developers who happen to be the biggest donors to the progressive conservative party, um, a lot fatter and a lot richer. It's corruption, it's a scandal. It should be the headline on the newspapers that and the headline that the the opposition is hammering on every day from now until the next election and my prediction right now is that it won't be that by the end of the week no one will be talking about this anymore sure it will come up but it's not going to be the thing it's not going to hang around the premier's neck in the way it should uh, and part of the problem is is this this kind of situation where opposition parties spend all their time throwing words like corruption and uh, a, a, a scandal around. Um, and, and usually it, they're not actually scandals and they're not actually corruption. They're just incompetence, if, if you know, at worst. Um, uh, and so when you actually do get a real scandal with, with real um, harm being done, something that should go down in the history book says, here was a government acting in an absolutely egregious way. Our ears are already so kind of tired of hearing things like scandal and corruption and whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, it's just politicians being politicians. It's no big deal. That's not, we, we, but, we, we've killed our own ability to convey the severity right. of, of, of a situation. Um, and certainly the opposition parties seem completely bereft of ideas of how to make this stick. Um, and it should stick. It really should stick. I, I tweeted out when I was watching the the uh, the press conferences, and, and then especially when the, uh, Premier Ford st stood up and failed to take responsibility for what happened. I, I said, you know, this report, um, this is a, this is a government ender. Like this is a, this is one of those reports. This is to me. I mean, if you look back, even like in a recent history, and not federally, I mean, recent history in, in the province, um, reports like this are what end governments you know, the the previous liberal government was brought down by a number of different um i'm not, I'm not gonna you're right i'm not gonna use the word scandal which is perceived mis perceived incompetence or perceived bad poor decision making on their part one of them was the gas plants which i would say the gas plant scandal and i i dare anybody listening to say tell me in five minutes what exactly was the the malfeasance there and what it comes down to is basically it was a bad decision on the part of the government show, to show me who got rich from the right who, where, where, where was that where was the where was the enrichment who who walked away with the billions of dollars in that scandal nobody it, it was just a bad decision and should they i don't know that that that's debatable people weren't happy that and that's the people are right in that regard this is textbook scandal somebody went to this government and explicitly told them i can't and this and this isn't this wasn't a, a plan that helped an industry. This wasn't a an industry wide policy to help grow or to meet a demand. This was a group of a handful of people 
who, by the way, what, I believe one of them was also at the Doug Ford uh, daughter's uh, stag and doe party that we all saw on the camera a few, a few months ago. They went and said, no, no, we're buying these specific plots of land that are in the green belt. It's cheap for us to do it now. I want you to free these up. You have to free these up from all, all restrictions so that I can, I can make my money off of it. And this government basically said, okay, we're going to do it. And what I wanted to say is, you know, it, it is the, the hypocrisy of this from the conservatives to get elected on, oh, the liberals are so corrupt. The liberals are so corrupt. Liberals made bad decisions and the, their, time to, their time to go had, had come. I'm not going to argue with that. But this, this is corruption. This is evident that this government does not operate in the best interests of you or I, listener. You, you can have your, your thoughts about whether you need more, a more conservative, more right-wing point of view or, what, or, or, or attitude at the till. I get that. But this is clear. Their interests, when they sit down to make their decisions, the interests of Joe and Jane Front Porch are not at the forefront of their minds. Their interests are their donors, the people who are their friends, the, the, the billionaire friends that they have bought and paid for, for. This is a business. This is a racketeering business to them. This is... A, a the billionaire class, the, the, the elite class in this province have bought and paid the provincial conservative government to say, you do what we want you to do. Consequences be damned. I don't care who it helps. It's, we want you to free up this plot of land, do it. We want you to sell off or allow us to, to operate this service or, or, or uh, uh, public good. You allow us to do it. And you allow us to have turn into a monopoly on the service, and this government says, "Okay, we'll do it." Um, this is this is scandalous. This is the stuff that should be bringing down a government. And you're right, Roland. If the provincial, if the opposition parties cannot figure out a way to kick open the door and shine the light on what is going on here and make this into the pol the issue and force some resignations that we are deeply screwed in this province, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, it should be possible. It's, it's always easier in a minority government. And, and the, the, uh, the opposition parties under uh, Tim Hudak um, had, uh, and uh, Andrew Horvath, did a much better job in a minority parliament situation, a mi minority legislative situation, where they controlled the committees and that part of the reason they got the gas plant story to hang around the liberals for so long because they just had these committee sessions committee sessions for year after year after year just digging over and digging mm -hmm. over bringing it back into the headlines back but that is easier to do when you control the committees and in a majority situation you don't control those committees um nevertheless <laughs> it is possible uh to to make stories stick. Um, and you've got to, I mean, part of the problem with the NTP, it seems to me, is, is that they never know, uh, they want to be everything to all men all the time. And they want to they want to support every good cause and very laudable. I'm not going to go at them for that. Unfortunately, politics is, is such a, and the attention you get in provincial politics is so limited um, that you've really got to have your one message. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, this government is corrupt. This government is putting money into the pockets of a handful of Vaughan developers. I mean, to use the words of um, uh, Rob Burton from a few years ago, possibly before this government even existed. He may have actually said this under a liberal government. I can't remember. Um, but Ontario is run by and for uh, a handful of Vaughan developers. Um, and, you know, maybe we shouldn't mention Vaughan, but I mean, it just has, so happens that that tends to be where an awful lot of developers are from. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't untrue under the previous government, but it's triply true now um, that, that everything revolves around uh, what those developers want. Everything they've ever asked for has been given to them um, with bells on um, uh, since and, this government came into office. And if you're, you know, if, if right now the liberals are having their leadership race, we've, we've sat down with all the, the contenders. And I would dare say this, this should be, leadership making material like you, you should be able to go in and start saying this is it this is what i'm doing day one you elect me as premier 
uh, we're coming in, we're we're kicking open the door, and we're 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 shot, we're turfing these crooks out. And my worry is like the liberals are going to be afraid of doing it because they're going to say, oh, but everybody thinks that we're crooked. And I say, no, this this is scandals. This is this in my thinking, and I think this this could be demonstrative. And I dare anyone to prove me otherwise. This might be the worst scandal in Ontario Ontario history, possibly even the country's, that a pro, a, a handful of individuals were able to get up to the premier's office to purposely change laws to benefit them directly. Uh, and, 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 it, and there was collusion. This wasn't, there wasn't like, a, this wasn't, that's what I, I, I wanted to try to emphasize. Like this wasn't like a, oh, we're going to let you know ahead, ahead of time we're planning to do this. Or this wasn't some broad policy campaign promise that they're holding true to. This was a direct collusion. Somebody said, no, we want you to do X, Y, and Z on this plot, of, this direct plot of land. And because we want to, because we want to make money off of it. And they said, okay, this is like, I don't know if this is criminal. I think it's worth a, worth an investigation at the very least, but this is by, I can't, I cannot think of another textbook definition of criminal or of, of corruption and just insider collusion than this scandal. And yeah, this is what's uh, going to be the benchmark for years to come. And, and let's, let's talk about. The, the evidence for, for, for what we've just alleged. Mm -hmm. um, so what makes, so the government is at perfectly at liberty to pass laws that make its supporters happy. It's nothing, that's legal. You can do that. Um, that's what they get uh, elected on. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's nice if you put it in your platform and everybody knows that it's coming, but ultimately you, they can pass laws. Or, or mandate letters. Yeah. Um, they can pass laws that, that, that do treat certain sectors of society with favoritism and it happens all the time every government does it um you know the the, the liberal federal liberals uh the prime minister was never stopped talking about how he was going to help the middle class well screw the working class i guess um you know, but he was basically like i'm going to favor this sector of society knowing that that's the sector of society that actually tends to to vote uh, and vote for him you can do that um what you can't do is do what um, uh, has happened here um, in that people have basically given the nod, you know, make sure you own this piece of land by this day, because what we're going to do is going to increase the value of that land by millions and millions of dollars. It's going to go from basically a piece of green space that is of no value to, from a development point of view. All you can do is farm it or just let the grass grow on it because it's green belt, um, to something that you can build high rises on or develop in whatever other way and make millions and millions of dollars. That is called insider trading when it happens in, in a stock market. And when it happens in a stock market, the people who do it go to prison. Um, that that in, passing of information, right, this is going to happen on this day. Well, OK, uh, just, just sure clarify. That's goodbye. That's that's not exactly what happened. It was a request of saying, "We're buying this land. You're going to change the rules to allow us to make billions of dollars." It was like it was it was more direct than that. It wasn't even like the the assumption was that of oh they're going to give the heads up. They didn't give the heads up. They were told by pri a handful of private entities, "Open up this plot of land. We've bought land here. You're going to open this up," and the government did that. That is. That that that's so much dangerous. It tells me that this government does not listen to us, the people. It is it is very. It, they are in the pocket of 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 special interest. They are they are literally in the pocket of billionaire developers, and that's where. And depending on the timing of how the government communicated with those development developers in that process. In that process of them saying we want this, because mm -hmm. um, them saying we want this is, is one thing. There's nothing illegal. Yeah, about everybody that. says they want something. Yeah. Uh, uh, if if the government then says, uh, yeah, we're 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 minded to do that. So you want to make sure that you know. Um, yeah. And the, the Toronto Star has done the studies looking at the dates of when lands were being purchased, when lands were being the changing hands. Um, 
around the time that this decision was being made. Uh, that, you know, that suggests, well, that, that is certainly something that if I was working for the OPP, I would want to look into more and very carefully. Right. I, I, I am, it, even if nothing, if this falls short of the criminality charge, um, who knows, it, it might, I, I, I don't know. This, this does fall short. I think it, at the very least, it, it, it can, you can clear, you can make the, the definitive statement that this is not a government for the, for the people as Doug Ford claims it is. It is for private business and private interests. And they're the ones who get their seat at the table. And they're the ones who get the invite to the back room to have that private discussion. And we're left with the collateral where we are collateral damage in this government. Um, I also said, it, this this behavior makes me say, um, well, you know, before we before we get onto that, I, I, I think we should go into uh, him throwing the mayor of Burlington under the bus, um, which I thought was, if you saw the Doug Ford press conference uh, trying to defend his actions, he was all I, I thought he was all over the place in his response. It was clear he was trying. They were trying to grasp some kind of defense for this. They were caught with their hand in the cookie jar, and they're trying to figure out how do we defend ourselves. And in the course, they they went to they're trying to do the Pierre Poilievre defense of oh this is you know the cost of living has gone up. And this is going to help bring down the cost of living. Your cost of groceries and cost of energy and all this stuff is going to bring it down. No, it won't. It, it it's not going to do anything to that effect. And then they say, well, we're in a housing crisis and we need to build housing. And basically saying this, without being too short, municipalities are not holding up their end of the bargain to meeting their, these housing targets that the province imposed on them. And he targeted Burlington. He, he singled out Burlington as a, being a city that is not meeting its targets. Now, in his defense, somewhat, um, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation did put out the, the new start numbers, uh, they're, they're around public data, if anybody wants to see it. And Burlington is, I think, like second from the bottom of a list of all municipalities in Ontario for new housing starts. Um, it's That's a problem, yes. But I think it, you know, there's, it, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. Um, it's an issue with a lot of history and we can, we can get on to yeah, that. The, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I think that's an entire other episode, I think, is that you know, there's so much there and it, for him to throw it off like it's basically just like Burlington sitting around twiddling their thumbs is a bit uh, disingenuous. Now, we asked, for all transparency, we did ask the mayor to come on the podcast to just say, like, do you want to respond? She uh, declined, because she, but she did put out a statement that said that she'll stand by the statement. Basically, there was one uh, little bit here that I think was interesting to be stated. She said, Burlington Council has unanimously accepted our pledge to issue 29,000 permits uh, for new builds uh, by 2031, and our city already has 25,000 units and growing in the development pipeline. We are willing to work with the development industry to help enable them to get shovels in the ground. Um, I, I mean, I, that that sounds promising. It, it does sound, okay, work is being done. Burlington's not just twiddling their thumbs and, and looking at the sky in this. I do think it's it comes down to the fact that this government does not have a credible plan other than just, oh, whatever the development industry comes to us and says they want us to do, that's what we're going to do under the guise of building. There is no plan here. There's no actual incentives to tell developers, no, you're not just sitting on plots of land because uh, you got permits 10, 15 years ago. And you're waiting for the market opportunity to, to start building. There's no incentives to do that. There is no pressure to do that. There is no pressure of just saying cities can't change, can't allow for that middle density. That would solve so much of the, the planning clog in not just Burlington, I'm sure, but all the municipalities in the 905 in, a, in Ontario to allow a variety of, of housing units to be built to meet the, these targets. That's not being addressed by this provincial government. I mean, there were there were some changes in that regard, but I mean, they're still basically hammering on the issue of of, of downtown development and sprawl. Burlington can't sprawl because it's already built out. Sprawl yeah. is off is really off the table, apart from a couple of patches. Um, and like other every other city in Burlington, there are uh, approvals sitting on the books that have been sitting on the books for years, 
that developers have in their back pockets that, that they are not putting into action. Approval has been done, been done by previous mayors, by previous councils, have been done by this mayor or this council. Um, I, I imagine part of the picture, I don't know how the Canadian mortgage and housing people, which is a developer lobby group, by the way, these are not independent people, they are very much um, the kind of uh, organization that lobbies on behalf of the development industry. Um, I don't know how they, they calculated this. It may have something to do with the, with the freeze on approvals uh, and freeze on approvals, not on building, I, I should say, um, that happened after this uh, Mayor Mead Ward came into office. Um, it actually doesn't slow down development much at all. It just means that the, the process of getting appealed to um, uh, the uh, the Ontario uh, whatever the hell it is these days Ontario <laughs> Land Tribunal um, uh, uh, kind of gets accelerated. Um, so you know the one thing that no council in in Ontario has the power to do is stop development. Um, they can right. they can reject applications, but this council hasn't even really been taking on or voting on any applications because of the the um, uh, the interim control bylaw that they put in place. Uh, they've just been kind of shelving them and then letting the process go on without them. Uh, what that eventually means is that in terms of their vote, voting on development applications, it all happens in private in in um, uh, in kind of deals with the, with the with the land tribunal. We're getting into the weeds here. I appreciate, but I mean it it, it is kind of important to to make the key point that no council anywhere can just stop development and, and like halt the development process. They can't, uh, they have to, they are legally bound to, 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 to act in certain ways when development applications come along. And believe me, there are people who would love to have the ability to stop uh, developments, but they don't have that power. They cannot act unreasonably. Right. They cannot yeah. act outrageously because the, the, Tri land tribunal will simply throw it all in the garbage. Well, the, the question that we've always asked is, tell me of a municipality that has successfully halted a development project. Any, uh, I, mean, like, I, mean, the, I always say that about the kind of NIMBY argument. It's like all these NIMBYs who are meant to be stopping developments. And it's like, show me the NIMBY who has actually ever stopped anything. Right. Um, they may halt it. They may delay it. They may create a whole lot of stink. If the developer wants something built, the developer will get something built. Um, because they have the right to build. It's written into the legislation. Right. Um, so if things aren't being built, if houses aren't being built, it's nothing to do with the mayor of Burlington or the Burlington Council or any other council um, stopping that from happening. It, it's because of the, all the other issues that, that, that are underway. And, you know, and it comes down also to the, the size and shape of the, of the municipality. Burlington doesn't have a lot of green space. It only has downtown. And it also comes down more than anything to, to developers choosing when they want to develop. Um, and you know, I, I could name you developments in Burlington that, that, that are not being developed. I can name you uh, uh, housing estates, which would be more at the affordable end mm. of the market where the developer came back year after year after year, getting extensions and, uh, to, to the approval for decades, right. uh, getting extensions to an approval that he was sitting on and not building. I would uh, just... I do want to point out a distinction that Premier Ford, in just before he was bashing Burlington as a city that's you know failing his, his targets that he's imposed on on the city, uh, he was praising Brantford as a you know a city that is surpassing its building targets, and and they are according to the criteria. Um, however, I, I did happen to drive through Brantford this past weekend on, on my way uh, on my way uh, through there. And if you've ever been to Brantford, folks, I'm sure you have. It is, there's a lot of open land around it. They have not hit their, their green wall. I don't think they're in, in the green, the green well, wall. They're beyond yet. it. So they're beyond they don't it. have that problem at all. They don't have it. And they have a lot of development going on because they just have a lot of flat land on the outskirts that just keep sprawling out. Now, Brantford is a smaller community. They could probably afford to do that for the time being. Um, but it's a it's a bit of an apples and oranges situation. Burlington does not have that luxury of saying, well, we'll just keep on building out. They we've 
Burlington has hit that wall, along, along with a lot of cities in the 905. It's not just a Burlington problem. They've, they're hitting that Greenbelt wall. Oh, and for, but, 20, but, but, basically for 20 years, uh, successive Ontario governments, including this government, including this government for the first four years that they were the government, have been banging on and on and on about the need to not go out, to go up, to intensify. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the right thing to do. It caused various problems, which Marianne Mivor could talk about all day. But nevertheless, that was still ultimately the right thing. This government, two years ago, or even a year ago, really, threw that entire history into the garbage, said, you know what, let's just sprawl anyway. Right. Um, uh, and, and that, and without any consultation, without any consideration, without any planning, is what they've done, uh, and it's ridiculous and it's wrong. And you can't criticize the cities for for still trying to go. Well, hang on a minute, you were telling us to do this for the last right. thirty years. Uh, that's kind of well, what we're geared up to do. But here's the thing: like, we're we're here. We've we've talked with a number of people across the board from homeless advocates to to economists and, and to politicians they're all saying yeah we're willing to intensify to build up but right now the game in ontario is you're either building a high rise or you're building building sprawl there is no flexibility to say okay let's build communities that we can all be proud of and live in and and fit the people that we know need to be housed there in a comfortable uh lovely home that they can be proud of, they can be safe in, they can they, they they can be part of the community, they are included into it. And we we aren't this government has not approached that. It is it is literally they, they're still they need to change the rules of how we build. We need to start thinking differently in terms of how we build these cities. And this province, this provincial government, has not given the cities the tools to say okay. Here are your targets that we that we think you need to hit to meet this one and a half million homes by 2030. Where they're staying, build it underneath the old regime. The 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 tools that were left to you for a 1930s a post war economy. When when the, the idea was okay, the 905 is nothing but suburbs, and everybody's going to commute into Toronto for their jobs. That era has ended. It ended years ago. We need something new, and this government does not want to do the hard work of passing the necessary legislation to give the cities the democracy and the tools that they need to build into the cities of the 21st century. Yeah, and one thing it has done, uh, just pick up one point there, is it has given them targets. It's basically said to Burlington, yeah. you've got to build 290,000 units, I guess, houses of whatever kind. Well, 29,000 um, permits. Yeah, which is... yeah ludicrous the city doesn't have the power to build a matchbox <laughs> in, in terms of development until someone comes and says i'd like to build a matchbox uh, everything is about the demand that comes from people who want to develop land coming to the city the city can certainly uh, aid the process in various ways but it cannot it cannot it has no initiative in this in this business at any point it can only react to what other people are doing. So this idea, I mean, the biggest lie about this whole situation is that the, the, the councils, you know, and this is just the, the conservative mentality th throughout. Basically, they cannot believe in, in government having any purpose. If they could, they would just abolish the whole damn thing. Uh, but the only reason they keep it around is because they have to. Um, and they, they think that, you know, like, well, the reason we're not getting houses built is because of these damn councils standing in the way because of all this red tape, blah, 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 blah. And it's just not true. It's well, you know, simply what, not true. You it's know what the sad thing lie. is? The Auditor General, uh, before this report, released an, another kind of damning, scathing report that this province has been hoarding away billions of dollars uh, that they had previously promised to be spent on various government pro projects or, or promises that they said it, but they've just been squirreling it away for we don't know what. So, I mean, in theory, they're sitting on this ca wealth of cash that is not being spent on schools, not being spent on our hospitals, not being spent on infrastructure. And I say, okay, that's scandalous in itself, but why not then just say, well, let's just build a bunch of housing. Let's go in and start building in... Because they don't believe why not? The government to do any such right. thing. Right. 
But, but, it, and it, I but can it tell you be. exactly what that money will be used for. It will be used for a bribe at the next election to uh, that will be given to the, the middle class and the wealthy as a tax cut, uh, because that's their entire raison d'etre. It's like uh, the, the purpose is to do as little as possible and to give uh, money back to the people who need it the least. That, that's every conservative government in the Western world, certainly that I've ever come across, yep. and it's certainly this one. I mean, they're utterly bereft of any kind of idea. I mean, we, we saw today Jack Siegel died, the, the conservative um, former- Hugh Siegel. Uh, Hugh, Hugh Siegel. Hugh, sorry, not Jack Siegel. Hugh Siegel, yeah. Uh, uh, former senator, former chief of staff to, to Brian Mulroney, someone who, who uh, I learned about first from, from liberals and from progressive politicians because he was so well loved. Uh, working across ideas, someone who support, supported and worked on the, the uh, basic income pilot uh, with the Ontario Liberals, uh, a genuine cross-boundaries progressive conservative um, with ideas, with intelligence and with, with a, a certain amount of, with a great deal from what I've heard, I've never met, met him, a uh, great deal of uh, uh, gravitas and, and uh, ability to to work across party genuinely work across party lines rather than talk about working across party lines which is what usually happens um this government has nobody uh, remotely approaching that no. you know, they have no ideas they they, no. they exist simply to line the pockets of their supporters um uh, and they don't believe it's their job to do things to make the world better because they don't believe that's what government is there for I just want uh, to, I'd like to, I think mean, we're coming up on our, on our time here and I just want to kind of close off on it, this idea is that this, it, it, I, I, would, I would argue that this progressive conservative party is not even a government, it's not even a political party anymore. It's a grift machine. It, 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 it is a, it is nothing more than a, a vehicle for a select few individuals to pilfer the public coffers and get rich doing it. Uh, we're seeing it right now. This is what happened. And then what I mean by a machine is they even have their own spin doctors at the end. And I, I want to take a shot at Brian Lilly, who wrote this unbelievable column in the Toronto Sun, basically saying, oh, nothing to see here, folks. This is a tempest in a teapot. His words, not mine. Uh, just go on about your business. Nothing to see here. And I thought, you cheeky bastard for you know not seeing this for what it is like you 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 have all people who who are uh, the, the the you know clinging to lib or conservative ideals and believe in conservatism and you're like at they got they got caught with their hand in the cookie jar and you're going to defend this as a nothing to see here and i said james ford's name to trudeau my god we would never stop hearing about this from you brian this is you are a hip a hypocrite to the nth degree on this and your got your spots are showing clearly um but i mean that's what it is it's clearly like somebody has in mind okay tell us what you want us to do we'll do it and we're going to have our arm of post media flunkies because the other thing is that, uh, doug ford also got to write an op-ed in the national post defending his actions which i've never seen happen before i've never seen a premier getting an op-ed after a scandal to defend their actions. That I thought was um, outrageous. And that's, that's, that's what conservative politics, I think, in this country, or at least in this province are, is a select few private interests get to control the levers of power. We get to pill for the public dollars, whether it's we're going to privatize healthcare, we're going to make it so we get to steal all the nurses and the doctors from the public sector, and we employ them in a private clinic that's going to be crappily run and we're going to charge you a boatload of money and somehow we'll put it on an app so it'll be great for you and we're going to make billions of, of it and when people say hey this doesn't work we're not we we think this is wrong we're going to get our our lackeys and post media uh news network to say no nope, nothing to see here folks go on about your business here's a tax here's a tax cut coming and oh yeah it's uh it's actually those those blasted liberals fault even though they haven't been in power for eight years yeah. Sorry, that's just my that's that like that's oh, I mean, uh, that's my I, rant I, and uh, what I, we're what we're getting hosed on in this province. I'm a, I'm a little testy on this. No, it's it's ultimately the the big the bigger 
the biggest problem of all is is the inability of our political class and of our media um what's left of the media uh to hold um any level of government to account uh, particularly at provincial levels i mean the provincial legislature oh in all honesty i mean i thought this when when i was involved in politics and when i was involved with, with one of the parties that was actually in government um the the, the ontario legislature is a terrible joke of of a legislature um the mpps have no power they are basically functionless drones who vote how they're told there's no such thing as a, as a backbench rebellion in in canada as far as i'm aware um which happens in other uh parts of the world look at the uk their backbench turfed uh three prime ministers uh all in one term i mean uh, the 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 backbench, the backbenches, the conservative backbenches in particular, have have kind of driven the the, the government agenda for the last uh, thirty years, really, in many ways. Mm -hmm. in, in UK, that's not necessarily a good thing because Brexit came right out of those backbenches. But nevertheless, that's democracy, you know. That's uh, but you're not going to, you know, what, you're right. You want to see that in Ontario in the legislature, it, progressive, conservative, liberal, or NDP, that will never happen. So uh, it should when this kind of thing happens, when when something so. Like I say, clearly egregious. It's kind of we all knew what was happening. The 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 Auditor General has just spelled it out for us in in, in words and in, in the words of a person who kind of has to be listened to. But we all knew that that was what happened. It's no surprise here. Um, and in a decent in a decent Ontario, there would be newspapers that would be doing a lot better than the Star is doing at, at just holding the government to account. Uh, better than we're doing, holding the government to account, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and there would be opposition parties that would be making hay out of this um, in an effective way, who would be, you know, uh, behaving in, in the legislature in a way that 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 is actually worth quoting in the news. Um, that would be uh, threatening. You know, there will be backbenchers with enough honour to say this is not good. I cannot support. A leader who behaves this way um, and it's my job to put pressure on my own leader to make some kind of apology to change to change things and there's a lot of things a lot of things short of a resignation and there's a lot of things short of calling the police which is what the opposition always goes to like let's call the police it should be that uh, mpps have enough power that they can hold their own leaders to account and say, hey, you really screwed up here. This makes me look bad. This is not on. You need to change this. You need to backtrack on those development uh, agreements. You need to take that land back out of the green belt. The, but you know, are we seriously suggesting that the the uh, PC backbenchers are going to do that? No, of course not. There's not a single one of them that, that that's worth the time of day. No. Um, on that note, I think we'll call this one to an end. Uh, but I might, we're clearly not going to be, this, this story's not going to end. I might, I just think this, there's more, this is an onion. There's more layers to be, be peeled back here and we're, none of it's going to make us happier or, or, or relieved when it, when it happens. So we will follow it as it, as it unfolds. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, take care. And we'll be back next week with uh, more of the 905er. Bye-bye. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you.